Now this is a remarkable place to me because you have on one side over here, modern science. This is the new world. And that is primitive the way it was thousands of years ago. This has not been touched. Well, indeed, it is old Florida, and it's old Florida preserved, which is unique. It's an exceptional place. It is just awesome to be able to come over the bridge at sunrise onto Merritt Island and into this refuge. And the greenery, the flora and fauna, the, the wildlife, it's just, it's spectacular. On a narrow stretch of Barrier Island, along Florida's eastern shore is an oasis. Here at the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, marshes and scrubland are broken only by towering lawn structures, and birds share the skies with rockets. Two, one, and lift off the Atlas V. Bordered by the Atlantic Ocean to the east and the Indian River Lagoon to the west, the refuge shares boundaries with NASA's Kennedy Space Center. To the north lies the unspoiled beauty of the Canaveral National Seashore. Within these borders, a variety of natural habitats provide sanctuary to more than 500 animal species, including 14 that are considered endangered or threatened. The stories of the Wildlife Refuge and the space program have been inseparably linked since the refuge was established in 1963 to manage the lands surrounding the launch complex. Today, these 140,000 acres at the northern end of Merritt Island provide a safe haven for hundreds of species of wildlife and offer visitors a trip back in time to old Florida. The combination of a great national wildlife refuge, of the space center, and the national park. There's no other place in the United States or in the world that, that something as magical as this exists. From the earliest ancient tribes to Spanish explorers and 19th century settlers, humans have been drawn to life along these shores for thousands of years. The island boasted plentiful fishing and hunting, the perfect climate for growing citrus, and a quiet life of relative isolation. By the late 1800s, small communities with names like Shiloh, Allenhurst, Wilson, and Orsino formed around these industries. From then until the early 1960s, generations of families made this wild paradise their home. My granddad uh, came down here from Kentucky in the late 1800s. He planted a grove over there for an Englishman, and the Englishman gave him some property in Shiloh. And he came over there and planted a grove and got the grove in Eldora going good, and he moved out over there with his family. Author Gail Briggs Nolan remembers visiting the family's homestead in the Happy Creek area, north of where NASA's iconic vehicle assembly building stands today. Her great-grandparents, Henry and Caroline Benecke, emigrated from Germany to New York in the 1860s and made their way to Florida. He found this area and came and lived on his sailboat that he had built to clear five acres, which you had to do to satisfy the Homestead Act. And uh, then he went back up to New York, married her, brought her down here, and they raised their family. U.S. Senator Bill Nelson is a fifth-generation Floridian. In 1986, as an astronaut, he flew into space aboard Space Shuttle Columbia, launching just miles away from the place where his grandparents' home once stood. My grandparents, Charles Hart Nelson and Jane Ellen Nelson, homesteaded under the Homestead Act on 160 acres of land that today is at the north end of the space shuttle runway. At the time, uh, the area was known as Wilson's Corners. 
Though it may have been a simple life, it wasn't an easy one. Settlers were self-sufficient, and many sought to get away from the noise and bustle of city life. Basically, they were loners, and uh, there were some pretty, pretty, much, pretty much real characters over here then. Uh, very nice, top of the world people. That isolation came with a cost. Long before electricity for fans or air conditioning existed on the island, residents endured intense heat, humidity, and that ever-present Florida pest, the mosquito. Anyone living and working among the orange groves and palmettos could expect to run across alligators, hogs, bears, snakes, even Florida panthers. We were eating supper there one night and uh, something sounded like a woman screaming which was a panther. And our grandmother, Lena, she heard a ruckus in the honey house. Apparently the bear kept coming to steal honey. So she hid in the honey house one night with a shotgun. And when he came back, she killed him. Her nickname as she grew older was Alligator Lena because she would catch alligators and sell them. She sold them to the tourists. Bruce McDonald remembers his mother's close encounter. She went in to get her cigarettes off the kitchen counter, and she kept feeling around. She couldn't find she couldn't find her cigarettes, so she actually had to turn on the light. When she turned on the light, there was a pygmy rattler wrapped around the pack. She didn't scream. I remember she walked in, said, "George, we have a, a rattlesnake on the kitchen counter." Another challenge was a basic lack of infrastructure. Early homesteaders traveled by boat across the Indian River to Titusville on the mainland before the first bridges were built. Instead of paved roadways, residents and visitors were faced with rough washboard paths that were more gravel and dirt than asphalt. When we bought the property, there wasn't a road coming in here because the people that homesteaded this thing, when they got it, they didn't have automobiles. They used boats to go to get the groceries and stuff like that. Paul Marion's parents were married in Jacksonville, and then his father brought his new bride to his home on Merritt Island, where the NASA News Center stands today. He drove her down from Jacksonville through the sawgrass, through the hammock and the grove, into the clearing where he had a, we'll call it a house. The measurements were 10 feet wide by 12 feet long. That's not, the, that's not a room in the house, that is the house. No electricity and no bathroom. So if you had to go to the bathroom, you took your hoe, you went out of the field, you hoed a hole in the ground, and when you're through, you covered it up. So that's what, welcome to my father's plantation. Most of those living on the island had settled there because of the solitude. Nolan recalls her great aunt enjoying the surroundings after a hard day's work in their Happy Creek Fishing Lodge. So it was a period of time in the family's lives where they were just happy, enjoyed the peace and quiet and the animals and the, the wildness of the place. In spite of all the challenges of life in such a remote and sometimes unforgiving location, many made a good living. Citrus groves were a big business for more than a century. At the time the refuge was established, 2,500 acres were dedicated to growing citrus. I started in the orange business when I was about six, seven years old. And that's what I did the rest of my life, mainly. Well, a lot of them used specialty fruit, and that's what our grove was. It was called king oranges, the great big huge orange, and they were delicious. So it, they were in high demand. Since the wildlife was abundant, fishing and hunting camps and guided expeditions became profitable ventures. Running a fishing and hunting operation often was an around-the-clock job. They had to keep the cabins clean, they had to keep them repaired, they had to keep the, um, the grounds clean and the docks. They had the docks to repaired and, and make sure that they were, they were in good shape. We had to clean our own boats get them ready for the next morning. And the uh, time we got that, people got in late in the summertime, you know, the day was long. And uh, it was probably 10, 11 o'clock before we get the boats cleaned out. 
for maybe 12. And some crazy nut would be out here at 3 o'clock in the morning, boiling a horn, wanting to go fishing. While citrus, fishing, and hunting were largely successful, some residents found other ways to make a living. My father had started actually a Bermuda onion garden, so to speak. Uh, he raised Bermuda onions because of the soil and the sand. It was very, very, it was black soil. It was very fine, but it was ideal for growing Bermuda onions. The McDonald family had planned to go into the cattle business, but quickly learned the area needed eggs. So they built a chicken farm with 5,000 chickens they called the Pretty Penny Ranch, providing eggs to area restaurants on the island and in Titusville, and selling them from their home, earning them the nickname of the first McDonald's drive through in the area. Off here to my right were the five, I think it was five rows of chicken houses. They have a cigar box that they put out there with some change. And what would happen at the end of each day very frequently are the workmen that worked, were working out the Cape, again before the Apollo program. Uh, I'm sure their wives like, you know, stop and get milk, stop and get a dozen fresh eggs. Of course, they got all their chickens through the mail then, so it was always fun to drive five or six hundred chickens in the back of a, back of a minivan station wagon for halfway through the day in the summertime. But. Although residents were spread out across the northern end of Merritt Island, there was a strong sense of community that helped make the best of the tough environment. For the children who visited or grew up on the island, it was a magical place filled with animals, woods, and waterways where they could play, learn, and have their own adventures. Brenda Bowie Gray and her cousin Craig Anson Rivers both remember visiting with their uncle Oscar and spending time fishing and crabbing on the river. He takes out in the channel you know, the deep part out there, and you tie a, a chicken neck or something like that on a string, and you could feel it when it grabbed it, and you pull it up. My Uncle Oscar would let my brother and I go out into the river in the little rowboat, and that was our entertainment during the day while my father was uh, in the onion field. So uh, it, it was times that, that we that were embedded in, in, in our hearts and minds uh, uh, for life. Part of the Beneke family lore centers on Lily. In the early 1900s, her father, Henry Beneke, trained her as a hunting and fishing guide. She began writing about her experiences and was published first in the newspaper in neighboring Titusville and later in Hunter, Trader, Trapper magazine. Because she was 16 years old and a girl, she didn't think that anyone would read them if she submitted them as Lily Benneke. So she chose a pseudonym. Her pseudonym was Uncle Dudley. So it was stories about the island, hunting and fishing stories by Uncle Dudley. In later years, the island's children attended school in Titusville. But at the turn of the century, tiny schools served small communities. Butler Campbell and Andrew Jackson settled with their wives and children in the area of the Hallover Canal and decided they needed a school for their children. My great-grandfather Butler, after being uh, a slave, you know, and, and coming from Anderson, South Carolina, he, uh, somewhere along the line, and I'm not sure where, he learned to read and to write. So, grandfather Butler, along with uh, Mr. Jackson decided that they would build the schoolhouse. The one-room Clifton-colored school was built in the early 1890s on an acre of land donated by a neighbor named Wade Holmes. As the students aged out of the Clifton School, they furthered their educations and had children of their own. And for most of the following century, the schoolhouse sat empty and unnoticed until it was rediscovered in 2004. Roz Foster, a historian and member of the Brevard County Historic Commission, was there when family members first saw it for themselves. When we came around the corner, there it was, almost standing, okay? What had happened by this time, uh, the south side had collapsed, but 
what we refer to as the divining tree, the, uh, the family named it, uh, was holding up the north uh, side. Uh, I never forget that day. Brenda was sort of awestruck. Uh, she, we came around and, and we were standing there and um, she called her mother and said, Mom, I'm standing in front of, actually standing in front of the schoolhouse and uh, tears in her, rolled up in her eyes. She got very emotional. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And this is that building that we found over there in the woods. The schoolhouse was carefully disassembled and moved to Titusville, where there are plans to reconstruct it. It will serve as an enduring reminder of the importance of education and of two families' insistence that their children have every opportunity to succeed. Decade after decade, Generations of families enjoyed the serenity of their own piece of paradise on Florida's east coast. But things began to change as the nation's space program started to get off the ground. For the kids growing up nearby, there was little chance of missing the deliveries of new space hardware or the rumble of a launch. One good block in the morning, your windows start rattling and and then all of a sudden the sky start lighting up and they'd be fired one of them rockets and it'd rumble for a while and then the next thing you know it'd be gone. We still see missile parts. You know, be on, they'd come out on the tractor trailers and they'd have the big canvas over. And you know, if my sister or I would see it, we'd yell out, missile, missile, missile. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, was formed in 1958. And in 1961, Project Mercury began with the launch of Alan Shepard, the first American in space. Shortly thereafter, the nation set its sights on the moon. The space agency needed land, and it intended to buy it from property owners on North Merritt Island. We found out, I used to watch a bunch of planes flying over. I couldn't figure out why they were flying over, what they were doing, they were taking pictures. And then finally the word got out that uh, NASA was going to buy this place. We knew something was happening, but uh, uh, nobody, you know, would tell what, what it was going to be or how much it was going to take. Some families read about the space agency's plans in the newspaper, while others were visited at their homes by government representatives. My father uh, joined with the other neighbors and hired an attorney from Orlando and it went through the courts a couple of years and we won. And after we paid the lawyers off, it was about the same as what they originally offered. In 1962, NASA purchased more than 80,000 acres of land previously owned by residents. It also negotiated with the state of Florida for nearly 56,000 more for a total of almost 140,000 acres. Families packed up their belongings and left the homes and land they'd loved. And over time, the abandoned homes were demolished. Well, we did come out here one last time and uh, it was a picture taking session. And I've got pictures of uh, the house and the clearing and the grove and all that stuff. Because uh, for us, it was a disappointing time. It was truly, truly heartbreaking. Uh, uh, it affected me from that point on, actually you know, because um, of the great memories and the great times that was spent uh, uh, on the land and, and in the water. And the, the older people, it, it was a real shock. Uh, my mother and dad didn't live a year after that happened. Most of them around here at their age didn't. You know, when you're born and raised in a place, you, you expect to be there. But things don't work that way. We were the last family to leave was in 1963 when we left and uh, it was the summer. I had just graduated from eighth grade when we left and uh, we really loved it out here and, and uh, I felt like crying when we had to leave, you know. In August 1963, NASA and the Bureau of Sport, Fisheries and Wildlife worked out a deal establishing the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. The refuge began managing wildlife on about 25,000 acres of NASA property. Later, the agreement was expanded to include all non-operational areas of the Space Center, encompassing 140,000 acres.
At the time, Nathaniel Reed was the U.S. Undersecretary of the Department of the Interior. And I put my hand up and said, hey, we're already there. Uh, we have a fantastic relationship with you. Uh, let's, uh, let's consider expanding the National Wildlife Refuge to the borders where you are content to, uh, to maintain. And uh, the administrator and I sat down and he passed me a map. I looked at the map and I put my hand across the table and I said, Administrator, from the standpoint of the Assistant Secretary, it's a deal. In addition to the wildlife refuge, in 1975, the stretch of Atlantic Beach to the north of Kennedy Space Center was designated the Canaveral National Seashore, making it a national park. Today, after decades of working side by side, officials with NASA, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and National Park Service still maintain that partnering spirit, proving each day that technology and a healthy environment can coexist in harmony. This is a 144,000 acre wildlife refuge and that's way more than we, the NASA Kennedy Space Center, can handle. Having the Fish and Wildlife Service take care of it for us, I mean, that is an outstanding partnership. Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge is such a fas fascinating place because of the multiple ecological systems from flatwoods, pine woods, the home of really an extraordinary number of scrub jay families, highly endangered. Uh, then you go into hammocks and into saltwater territory. Uh, you have the lagoon, which is the home of, winter home of thousands of duck. The uplands, both uh, in the hammocks and on the, uh, on the and basically on the seashore uh, territories, plus the pine woods, are the home of hundreds of thousands of migratory birds. One bird frequently spotted in the refuge is the majestic bald eagle. There are several active nests in and around Kennedy Space Center but one in particular has been in use for decades. This large, well-known airy is nestled high in a pine tree off a busy roadway at the heart of the spaceport, where tour bus drivers pointed out to visitors. Well, it's been there for 20, 30 years, and you know, very strong, withstood hurricanes, but the eagle, I mean, it's symbolic of what we do. It's symbolic of our nation, the perseverance, strength, beauty of a soaring eagle. You know, it, it's kind of the Kennedy Space Center. While delicate ecosystems across Florida have been lost to development, the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge has remained a natural oasis, not only for the flora and fauna that call it home, but for the visitors who flock here for birding, boating, photography, or just serenity. And for many of those who left long ago, this is a legacy they're proud to be a part of. We do like the fact that when we're got a group of people in our living room and they show the countdown clock, I'm the first one to point out the fact that our house was just on the other side of the countdown clock. They were pleased that this particular area went to the wildlife refuge and it's, it stayed wild. They were very appreciative of that. There's not a bunch of condos and stuff like that built on these river banks and it's more or less like it was when we, you know, lived out here. If it had to happen, I'm glad it's worked out like it has. You guys are doing a good job here, and you need to continue doing what you're doing because, you know, for me, selfishly, you're preserving it. For years to come, generation after generation will be able to experience old Florida in all of its majesty at the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Teddy Roosevelt gave to the world in the creation of Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge, the first one, he gave to the world an idea, a vision, a concept that will continue. Merritt Island is a perfect example of seizing an opportunity and making a vision come true.